Well, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar, Healthy Eating Meets Healthy Activity for Busy Families. I'm Greg Berry, Director of Communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Since we're virtual, please excuse technical issues or glitches that may pop up. If you experience issues with your video or audio, click the reconnect button on your screen to get back to the webinar right away. A quick note, this webinar is being recorded. We'll have a replay available for you by tomorrow. Also, if you have any questions for Dr. Mollering throughout his presentation, please drop it in the chat. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. Tonight, we're excited to have Dr. Doug Mollering with us. Dr. Mollering is the University Professor of Psychology and Associate Vice President for Research Facilities and Infrastructure here at UAB. He is a two-time graduate of UAB, earning his Master of Science in Basic Medical Services and PhD in Pathology. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Mollering to our webinar series. Thank you so much for joining us and clearing some time in your schedule. And I'm just gonna turn things over to you because I know you have a few uh, mouse clicks to get your presentation going. Thanks, Greg, I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for joining. Um, let me share my screen. And we, we see you. All right, so welcome. We're gonna talk about healthy eating meets healthy activity for busy families, as Greg mentioned. Um, again, I am Doug Mollering. I'm in the Department of Nutrition Sciences and I'm an associate professor uh, and I teach and run a research lab and also am very active in the community. And so one of the things that I enjoy is talking to people about how you can feel your best in all areas of life in health and wellness um, within yourself, your family, and your community. And so this is a picture of our family. Um, on the far left is our oldest daughter, Evie. She's a junior at Auburn. Uh, in the white sweater is our daughter, Scout. She's a sophomore at UAB studying abroad in Greece this term. Um, Henry is our son in the uh, jacket, the uh, uh, third from the left and my wife, Katie, in the yellow sweater, and that's me in the brown jacket. And then our other daughter, Poppy, is a junior at John Carroll. And um, as we go through this, this is gonna be an interactive presentation, meaning I want you to participate. You won't be able to actually talk, but there are gonna be some activities that I want you to participate in as we do them, and I'm gonna do them with you. And so let's start out with raising a healthy family. And the approach that we take is best laid plans sometimes don't go the way that you want. And what I mean by that is sometimes you need to approach every day as if it is an adventure. And I um, liken that to if you're on a hike, let's say you're planning to take a hike and you know that your destination is a beautiful waterfall. Well, as you begin that hike, you've brought your waters, you've brought your snacks, your walking sticks, whatever it else that is pleasant for you to have on that walk. There's a whole lot of things that happen between when you get out of that car and start that walk and when you get to that waterfall. And that's what I mean about raising a healthy family. You have to be ready for the serendipitous adventures that you may not have planned on and also the whammies where let's say somebody jumps off the trail and ends up stuck in a bush or falls in the water. You just have to take that um, approach of let's look at it as an adventure and let's uh, embrace everything that we encounter along this way, whether it's good or bad. And so, Taking that into account, as you're raising your healthy families, um, remember these are choices that you're making for them at the times when they're unable to make their own choices to help them guide their future plans and how they're gonna create and interact and do things for themselves. And as these pop-ups are, are popping up, I'm just highlighting that I, on every single day, there are adventures that they can do for themselves. They can brush their hair, have their socks ready, their tops and their bottoms, brushing their teeth, washing their hands and their face. And, you know, as we're just coming out of um, what hopefully never happens again with COVID and the shutdowns, I think uh, hand hygiene and just hygiene in general has come to the forefront. So just teaching these habits on the far 
uh, right corner, you can see yoga mats. So it's been shown that even starting the day with a little bit of activity helps to get people going as opposed to wake up, brush your teeth, here's your breakfast, get your homework. That kind of thing is maybe slow roll in and get a little, get up a little earlier to give people an advantage of let's get your body woken up before you then begin your day to then enjoy your day. Going into the nutrition component, which is my forte in the, the, um, the courses that I teach. This is a myplate.gov plate. It's the U.S. Department of Agriculture is putting this out for us. And it is a plate arrangement that helps us and also can help your kids, your family, anyone that you want to understand that the plate arrangement, what you have in front of you on that plate matters. Every bite counts. But if you think of your plate as quadrants like are shown, half of your plate are fruits and vegetables. How many of us are getting half of our plate as fruit and vegetables? Very few, I would guess. It's hard for me and I live this. So thinking about how you arrange your plate and what you have at any given meal matters. When you're putting these veggies together and these fruits together, get as many different rainbow colors of fruits and vegetables that you can on any given week. And the why behind that is those colors in those fruits and vegetables provide very valuable nutrition. They are called phytochemicals. And the colors of those fruits and vegetables are actually providing that benefit. Half of your, uh, a quarter of your plate would be grains. That's in the top right corner, but half of those are whole grains. And some people are confused about whole grains. Whole grains are simply unprocessed grains. The bran and the kernel are intact, which means you're not losing the nutrition component of that um, grain. When you process that grains, you're only getting the starch component, the carbohydrate component. That's what it means when you have whole grains. In the bottom corner, it's lean with protein. You wanna have a, a quarter of your plate with lean protein. Lean protein is, is any of a number of things. If you're a vegetarian, it can be beans. If you are a carnivore or an omnivore or a pescatarian, which is someone that eats fish, you can have fish, turkey, chicken, those lean proteins. And then on the top corner, your calcium rich uh, foods that can include dairy. They can include fortified foods where that calcium is added back into foods. For instance, in the case of almond milk and other types of uh, dairy substitutes. So how do you build this healthy meal? This is a general guide on 10 tips for how you can build these healthy meals. The first one is, as I said, make half of your plates the fruits and vegetables. Those have those micronutrients, which are vitamins, minerals, and other phytochemicals that your body needs to burn the fuel, which are the macronutrients, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the fats. So if you don't get those vegetables and fruits on that plate, you're not getting the micronutrients that you need to actually use those foods. Your body can store foods if they are energy dense, which means you don't have a lot of these fruits and vegetables or micronutrients present. Your body can store those as fat, but they may not be able to burn them as fuel for energy. So the other one is add lean protein. Lean protein foods like lean beef and pork, chicken, turkey, beans, tofu, um, seafood is wonderful. The colder the water fish that you find, for instance, salmon or a very cold water fish, the higher omega-3 fatty acids are present within those um, fish. Whole grains, okay? Look at the words. It should say 100% whole grain or 100% whole wheat because they have more nutrients and fiber, as I mentioned earlier, than those refined grains. Don't forget your dairy. You know, it can be a low fat milk. It has a uh, same amount of, of calcium and other essential nutrients as whole milk, but it doesn't have quite the same amount of calories. 
avoid extra fat, like in the heavy gravies um, that are adding extra fat. In some of the salad dressings, there's actually a lot of added sugars and fats. So you may want to take a look at that. So for instance, you can steam your broccoli and maybe not top it with the cheese sauce or, or sprinkle some low fat Parmesan. Take your time. Every bite matters. As you're eating the food, be aware of what you're eating. The distracted eating is one of those things that can cause people to overconsume because they're not actually focused on the food they're eating and the amount of food they're eating. So take your time. Eat slowly. Enjoy it. Think about how it tastes. Think about the flavor. Savor that food. Use a smaller plate that smaller plate can help you with some portion control um, so that you, if you are one of those clean plate club folks like I was and the way I was raised, if you clean your plate and eat everything, if you set up a smaller portion from the start, it's not going to be as bad as if the portion size is twice as big. Take control of your food. Eat at home as often as you can because you're going to know exactly what is in those foods. You're going to know what you're putting in. You're going to be able to choose how you're cooking it. Try new foods. What When the, the kids were younger and even still now, we, when we would go to the grocery store, every kid got to pick one new fruit or vegetable that they had never had. And we brought it home and either tried to figure out how to cook it or just ate it raw. Some of them we went back to. Some of them we really couldn't figure out. But it's kind of a fun thing that you can do. For those like myself that have a sweet tooth, and, and, and my sweet tooth is uh, Grater's Ice Cream, for anyone um, who is familiar with the Greater Cincinnati area, you know what I'm talking about. But an alternative to that is to indulge in fruit. Go with uh, strawberries, blueberries, boysenberries, raspberries, uh, cherries. Um, you could also have bananas, oranges, apples. I'm looking at my countertop, which is cluing me in as to how to suggest what fruits to have. Try a few uh, or, or make a yogurt parfait for dessert. They're really good. Um, these are the plate arrangement uh, plates that I was talking about. And the link on the bottom has the link if anyone is interested in trying to help a community, a family, a school, their own kids, how to arrange their plates to know what these things are in a fun way. The link is on the bottom, and that's where you could go and actually purchase these. And I think they sell them in as low as eight or nine plates at a time, all the way up to real bulk purchases. All right, everybody, this is the interactive part. You have to stand up and wave your arms for help. Anyone from my generation, pretend you're on Gilligan's Island and you're trying to find somebody to help you get off. For the younger generations, you're just waving as if you're trying to get the band's attention up on the stage. Okay, so wave your arms for help. All right, as I said, I'm an interactive speaker, so I hope you did that. We got a couple more as we go through. Now, on to healthy breakfast. And these are just suggestions. These are things that I found that... Breakfast is usually the hardest thing to do. So these are 16, 10 minutes or less breakfasts. They have pictures there, scrambled eggs, turkey bacon, English muffin toast with spinach. You can do an omelet, take all your veggies, throw them in there, add turkey, add chicken, add tofu. A single serving muffin only takes two minutes. You just spray the mug with the vegetable spray, teaspoon of butter, an egg slightly beaten up, quarter crown of flax meal, half to a teaspoon of cinnamon, half teaspoon baking powder, packet of Splenda or another sweetener. I prefer a tablespoon of honey. Add chopped walnuts, pecans, or other in an 1,100-watt microwave, which is what most of us have. It's only 45 seconds. Boom, instant muffin. You can make a batch of oatmeal. Add the raisins, nuts, cinnamon. Mix in things that you want to have with it. Eggs in the microwave are, do are doable as well. Make sure... Pardon me, you take them out of the shell, <laughs> um, whisk them, sprinkle with cheese, tablespoon of milk, some seasonings, microwave for 20 seconds. They will expand and then contract. Boom, they're ready. Making a smoothie, Greek yogurt, milk, um, throw in granola, fruit, nuts, anything else that you like with that. You could put eggs in a basket, which means you cut a hole in your toast with a cookie cutter. 
fry the toast in a in a skillet, crack the egg in the hole in the skillet until it's cooked, and it kind of makes a fun breakfast. Um, moving on to healthy breakfast, your own trail mix as you as you make your own and mix them together with the mixes that you'd like to have, or go buy the pre-packaged ones. It's your choice. Quick serve pancakes. I'm not going to go into the details on those, but you can view this video as many times as you want. And I imagine you would also be able to pause them or take a picture if you want to get the actual recipe for how to make those quick serve pancakes. Fruit, whole grain toast, mini cheese plate. Again, these are just quick, healthy, 10 minute or less breakfasts that you can then get and go out the door. Things that we do in the mornings, not all the time, but most times is I love bacon and eggs. I love an avocado toast. Um, I love having yogurt with fruit in the morning, throwing in the nuts. And these can all be put in cups that you can then take on the ride as you're going in if you happen to be running late. So. Moving on to some food categories and choices because I'm not sure what everybody is familiar with. So I wanted to show these. These are called macronutrients. Macro means large, which means you need a large volume of these three macronutrients every single day, proteins, carbs, and fats. The micronutrients are called micro because you don't need as much, but without the micronutrients that are in the fruits and veg, you won't be able to use these macronutrients for energy. So here are some examples of the proteins, chicken, turkey, salmon, eggs, Greek yogurt, tuna, white fish, lean grass-fed red meat. Okay, grass-fed versus grain-fed. Grain-fed meat changes the ratio of omega-3, which is a healthy fatty acid, to the omega-6, which is associated with inflammation. Grain-fed pork, chicken, cows, any of those types of grain-fed animals have a less healthy meat where the ratio of the omega-3 to omega-6 in their meat itself is less. So grass-fed is going to cost more, but you're getting a healthier meat. Short answer. Whey protein, cottage cheese. Carbs, sweet potatoes, much better than a white potato. It's got a much higher nutrient content, fiber content. It's going to be better for you. Brown rice, rolled oats, beans, quinoa, apples, berries, buckwheat, whole grain tortilla, whole grain bread. Those are the carbs. Now on the far right, we've got fats, almonds, coconut oil, avocados, flax seed, chia seeds, pecans, olive oil, almond butter, peanut butter, salmon. So almonds are very unique in that they also have about a third, a third, and a third. They're about a third fat, a third protein, and a third carbohydrate. And they also have essential micronutrients, vitamin E, and magnesium, which is needed for energy, are in almonds. They're a superfood. Coconut oils, again, a superfood. The key messages with these are to enjoy your food and make every bite count. Avoid those oversized portions and drink water instead of sugary drinks. So how do vegans get their protein? Vegans can get it from a variety of sources. On the breakfast example, tofu, avocado, whole wheat bagel. For a snack, a peach oatmeal bar. Okay, there's about four grams of protein. For lunch, this is a uh, Satan, uh, Satan, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that one, uh, wrap. And for dinner is a tempeh marsala, and that has about 20 grams of protein. So, uh, vegans can get protein, but they need to be aware of how they're getting it and where they're getting it. Something else to be aware of is vegetarians and vegans are B12 deficient because B12 is only in animal meat. So if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, you would need a B12 supplement. I'm not going to go into much more about that in this talk. Carbs. What are the topics that I'm asked a lot about are, are carbohydrates. So, and, and there's been topics and, and books that have been written about good carbohydrates versus bad carbohydrates. And so carbohydrates are 
uh, starches. They're your breads. They're your cereals. They're in your fruits. They're in your vegetables. Um, carbohydrates are sugars as well as having a whole uh, fiber and nutrients in them. So when you hear good carbohydrates, those are the complex carbohydrates, okay? Those are the um, carbohydrates that are um, not processed and they have more of the whole grains present. They're higher in fiber and nutrients. They have a low glycemic index, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide you'll feel full longer with fewer calories and it naturally stimulates your metabolism. They are um, harder to digest and the energy is released slower over a longer period of time, which is why you would feel full longer. The simple carbohydrates are the ones that others have called bad um, are generally those processed foods, those foods that are processed and have added sugars. They're low in fiber and nutrients, have a high glycemic index. It's empty calories, basically, which means there's no nutritional value, and those calories are simply going to be converted to fat. They also help uh, to increase your blood glucose levels very rapidly, which will make you feel tired. So let's talk about glycemic index, okay? Whoops, sorry about the pop-ups. Looking at this graph and to orient folks, on the left, on the y-axis are your blood glucose levels. So down here, we're eating food. On the x-axis is time and hours. So we've eaten food. The high glycemic index foods means that those foods will release sugar faster into your bloodstream and you will get a rush of sugar, which also comes with a rush of insulin to help that sugar to be put into the tissues that otherwise need that sugar to bring your glucose level back. Those insulin sensitive tissues are muscle, fat, and also other organs that use the sugar. So these high glycemic index foods include these processed foods, white breads, any white rices, uh, sugar added foods, biscuits, cakes, chips, those types of foods have a high glycemic index where your sugar levels go up very rapidly and then also come down rapidly. Now your low glycemic index foods are more of the complex carbohydrates and the healthy fats and proteins. Basmati rice, vegetables, lentils, pasta, whole grain bread, oats, oranges, uh, whole oranges, not the juice. The fiber in the fruit of the whole food slows the absorption of sugar. So juices per se are very high glycemic index foods and are actually very similar to a sugar sweetened beverage. Now, this arrow is pointing to about an hour and a half later. So these high glycemic index foods, if you'll notice, there's a little trough underneath that line that is where your blood sugar levels are actually going below what the normal level is because so much sugar has gone in so fast and so much insulin has, released, has been released that you have a trough. That trough is a physiological hunger. So you can eat a large amount of calories that are very high glycemic index foods and processed foods and still be hungry an hour to an hour and a half later because it doesn't have the sustained feeling of fullness that come with the healthy fats or the proteins or the nuts and those healthier, lower glycemic index foods. And what's been shown is those high GI foods, you're actually twice as hungry within an hour to four hours than if you were to have almonds. So for instance, if you eat 
just as an example, 10 bowls of Frosted Flakes. And I don't want to pick on Frosted Flakes, but I am. If you put in a cup of almonds, it would slow the release of that sugar down and make you feel full longer if you had the almonds with those Frosted Flakes. So that's just a, a suggestion. All right, now we have to stand up and sit down five times. These are car chair sits. Come on, get off whatever you're sitting on. I'm doing it, and I've had three knee surgeries. Here we go. Come on. Oh, there we go. That's five. Those are chair sits, up downs. You can do them anytime you want, anywhere you want, and they're super healthy for you. I try to do about 25 to 50 every day. I hope you all did it. Now, superfoods. These are the rainbow of colors that I'm talking about. Fruits and veggies, the celeries, the broccolis, the carrots, the onions, the apples, the green peas, the lentils, the kale, the spinaches, those dark green leafy vegetables. Those are superfoods. And what I mean by superfoods, there's a number of nutrients within these foods that have been experimentally tested and shown to provide benefits. I'm not going to go into those details now within this lecture, but it, they are there. So getting these foods in on a daily basis is going to increase your energy. You will feel a difference. And if you are tired of chewing because of the amount of fiber and things within those fruits, Blend them up. You lose nothing if you blend them up. Don't juice them. That's different. Just blend them up in a blender and make a smoothie out of them to make it easier. And then you can mix your favorite fruits and tastes in with those vegetables and get them all at the same time. So how to get kids to eat vegetables. This is not a simple thing. Um, it's been shown that Children develop their taste buds from in utero, so what the mother has eaten while she's pregnant, all the way through about five years old or when their taste buds are being developed. The more exposures to bitter foods like broccolis and Brussels sprouts and those types of bitter foods that they have, the earlier those exposures, the more likely they will develop a taste for those. It's also been shown that for any new food, especially a bitter food, you have to expose it to those kids 10 to 15 to 20 times in a variety of different ways because they just have to get accustomed to that. So, for instance, if they're averse to raw broccoli, steam the broccoli, boil the broccoli, bury the broccoli in ranch dressing, bury it in cheese sauce. Mix it up into a puree and put it in your spaghetti sauces. Anything that you can do that will expose their palate, even if it's masked, to get them to get used to those flavors will help. What we used to do is we would leave a vegetable tray out on the counter when the kids got home after school, and that was their choice. And we, we didn't you know, prevent them from getting other things, but that was always readily available and eventually they just got used to it and it became part of what they did. So here are some of these tips and I mentioned some of them. Dips. Everything tastes better with a dip. Allow them to have those dips. Smoothies. Mix a little spinach into it. So I used to make a lot of smoothies. I haven't made them as much um, lately. And I would always have to be very careful with how much kale or spinach I put into them because it would change not only the texture, it changed the color. And the kids knew if it came out green that there was a lot of spinach in there. So, but you can play with it. Just add things as you'd go and you'll get the feel for whether you like it or not. Popsicles, you can make your own popsicles with fresh fruits and vegetables. I mentioned trying different forms, raw, cooked, frozen, um, you can act like an herbivore. Do they have a favorite animal that's an herbivore, a plant eater, and pretend to be that animal for the day and only eat what that animal eats? Give those vegetables funny names. What does this look like? So in this particular example, um, they, uh, their kids were into dinosaurs, and they called broccoli dinosaur trees, and, and they love to eat those dinosaur trees. Cut them into fun shapes. 
grow your own. Having kids being involved in a garden early is a wonderful opportunity, not only to interact with them, but for them to see how those fruits and vegetables are actually grown and have a value to them when they bring them in and they cook them for themselves. Sneak it in, as I mentioned. Um, one of my favorite go-tos is I would mix cauliflower, carrots, and broccoli, blend it up into our spaghetti sauces. And the kids never knew for years because I used that as my spicing as opposed to putting basil or oregano or something else in there. And they got their servings of vegetables every time we had uh, pasta. Um, eat the veg yourself. Children learn by example, they are sponges. They are little pitchers who absorb what they see. So the more often you're doing these things, the more often they're gonna wanna do these things. As I mentioned a little earlier, keep trying. It takes 10 to maybe 15, 20 times for these exposures to new foods. Just keeping it on their plate and allow them to just try a bite, just at least one bite. And then if they don't, okay, don't force them, bring it back in another way, a different day, disguise it, do those other things. Re-exposures are the thing, not a you can't leave until you eat this. I tried the you can't leave till you eat this and trust me, it doesn't work. Here's a story, uh, one of our daughters, uh, we were eating Brussels sprouts, she hated the Brussels sprouts. Uh, she wasn't allowed to leave till she finished them, so she showed me her plate was empty. And, you know, we went and did whatever we were doing afterwards. We were playing a game or something. And I said, hey, what's going on? And she had stuffed them in her cheek and had just had the Brussels sprouts still in her cheek so that she could get up from the table. Uh, the the, the must-try-it rule is, is an easier way to go. At least one bite. Um, making muffins again. Most kids will eat anything if it's in a muffin. Read books to them about the fruits and vegetables. There's a couple examples. Bribe them. If they've got a favorite something, hey, if you try this vegetable or you eat this vegetable, you get to do this or go out and play with your friends and do that. You know, do what it takes, but multiple exposures over multiple time. The game we play is called Snap. That's with carrots. So you take these baby carrots and you try to make the loudest sound that you can when you bite it. And it's a competition. And eventually they forget that they're eating these and they're just snapping through them. Sometimes they'll get a bitter one. You just kind of make that face that you make when you get something bitter, chew it up and then go again and find a better one. Um, it's a really fun game. Uh, um, we really enjoy that game actually. All right, so now we are sitting here, stretch your legs straight out and squeeze your quads for 30 seconds, which means just squeeze your, your legs as hard as you can. Five, six, eight. Okay, come on, do it now. Some of you are cheating. Here we go. I think we're at about 20. And five. All right, all right. Again, I told you it was gonna be interactive. So, Moving on, we're not just going to be a composite of what we eat, drink, or do. We have our spirit, we have our mind, and we have our body. So when you're approaching anything, approach it from a wholeness perspective. It is going to be counterproductive to uh, use force or be angry about an activity you want your kids to participate in willingly. It's, it's something that I have had experience with. And as you're going through this, the more you make things a game and fun, the easier it is to adopt it. And it's, it's hard because I had to unlearn because I was, uh, I grew up in a wonderful family, but it was a, you do this and this is, you're going to do this. It wasn't a, Hey, hey, let's do this. <laughs> and so that brings me to the top right uh, picture where laughter is a mark of a healthy spirit. So if you're able to laugh as you're enjoying these new flavors or or even have them talk about it, why why is that so weird that you don't want to try this new fruit or vegetable or or what would you call it or is there a way that you think we could make it that would be better and that tastes better? Because you're ultimately working together. And that's one of the things that helps us is 
we work together, you know, we, we and, and, and in the um, quote on the left, it's, it's in this house. We are real. We make mistakes. We say, I'm sorry. We give second chances. We have fun. We give hugs. We forgive. We do really loud and we are patient and we love. Other things that I'm looking at our wall is we always tell the truth, respect each other, listen to each other, be kind, help each other, say please and thank you, have fun, laugh together. The, the, the things that we used to do and we still do with our youngest is on any given day, there's four things they have to have thought about actively. What did you learn? And we share things too. I still share four things that I do and am active in how I think about it. What did you learn? What did you do for fun? How were you kind to yourself? And how were you kind to others? And if you have that philosophy of thought as you're going through any of these things, nutrition, activity, and everything else, it really brings a, 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 a sense of sharing and community to what you're doing. So on to some of the details of the why does this matter? So a typical American diet, and this is um, some data from probably a, a, a while ago, early 2000s, if I'm not misremembering. At the top, these are the things we need to eat more of. And you can see that goal line, more whole grains, more vegetables, more fruits, more dairy, seafood, oils, fiber, potassium, vitamin D, and calcium. The things we have to eat less of, and the sofas are the solid fats and added sugars. Solid fats are solid at room temperature. We exceed the limit by about 300%. Refined grains, sodium, and saturated fat, those are the things that are best if we were to limit those more and to get more of what we've been talking about earlier. Drinking more water is critical. So as you're playing, working, drinking water is critical. It is the 80% of your body is made up of water. So you want to have water when you are just going through the day. I've got mine right here that I drink regularly. Drinking milk at meals is healthy for the kids that are growing. They need the additional calcium and vitamin D in order for their bone formation. In athletics, and I've been a coach and an athletic director for a number of years, the Gatorade that the kids drink has more sugar than they need for one hour of an activity in an indoor event. And why I say that is if you eat anything when you're drinking Gatorade, Gatorade or Powerade, I'm not picking on those, the, the full sugar Gatorades or Powerades are designed for maximum water absorption at that amount of sugar that's in that drink. So if you eat anything else that is going to have sugar in it, you're actually dehydrating. And that's why they came up with G2, which has 50% of the sugar, and the G0s, which actually have none of the sugar. Because you really want the electrolytes to come back in, not the sugars. And actually, ironically or not, Pedialyte is one of the best replenishing electrolyte drinks that you could drink in an athletic event as opposed to the Gatorades and the Powerades, but they, the Gatorades and Powerades have a much bigger marketing budget. So drink more water. And the why, if you look at sugar added drinks, this is a 20 ounce cola as an example. There's 16 teaspoons of sugar. There's about four grams of sugar in a teaspoon. I think metrically, because I work in a lab, Others think with teaspoons, so I wanted to share that. That's the equivalent of 16 table packs of sugar in one 20 ounce Coke. No nutritional advantage, straight up sugar. And more than likely, that sugar is not gonna be a sucrose, it's gonna be a high fructose 
or a corn syrup based sugar. So these these sugary drinks add up. They they are really increasing the amount of added calories. And just as an example, if you had a soda, a juice box, and a sports drink and a fruity drink in one day, okay, four of these things, more than 41 teaspoons of sugar, which is more than 41 table spat, table packets. That's the same amount of sugar you would have in 38 chocolate chip cookies, just to give you an example. And you'd have to burn off 62 pounds of fat each year if you drank just four of these a day. So being aware of what you're sharing and drinking is, is something to, to bring into your consciousness. I'm not saying cut it out totally. I'm saying just be aware of it. And if you can have water as opposed to a sugar added beverage, I would choose the water or a low fat milk. When you're craving these sweets, and I do as well, go to the fruit um, on our counter. And the reason I looked up earlier, you know, we have bananas, apples, oranges. We have strawberries, blueberries, um, cherries, raspberries. Go for those fruits. They will give you the healthy fiber and nutrients as well as that sweetness. Read your labels when you're buying foods. Make sure there's no added sugars. Or if you are buying something that you really like, how many of those added sugars are in there so that you know and are aware of that? Sorry, I was checking my time. When we do family events, and this is something that has just evolved over time, all of our tasks are family events. We, uh, if there's something everybody needs, we will look at each other and hold our hands up and we will shoot rock, paper, scissors. And whoever loses has to do whatever that family event is that all of us need and want. And we've, we've been in public doing this and folks are looking at us and it just, it brings everybody into it so that it's not anybody's individual. We all need this as a collective. Um, things that can help to prepare yourselves when you have big families or even small families is try to prepare as much on the night or weekend before so that your morning goes a little smoother. Um, when you have poor decisions, whether it's the children's poor decisions or your poor decisions, stick to the consequences. And what I mean by that is we actually have run scenarios by our kids where let's say you don't turn in your homework. Let's say you're late. Let's say you do something you shouldn't have done. What should those consequences be? And they tell us, not at the time of the event, beforehand we've talked about these things. And then those consequences they have designed for themselves, they're accountable for, and the same for us as parents. We can talk with them about, okay, what are the consequences if we do something like that? Or if we, you know, break whatever rule that we have uh, as a family and, and to stick to it, to have those consequences hold up for everybody in the family. All of our family support items are family support items. Others call them chores, and I don't like that word. So everything that we do is a family support item. Everyone shares it. You pick one you like, enjoy it while you do it, and finish it once you begin it. And those family support items are laundry, dishes, garbage, pets, whether it's feeding them, cleaning out the litter boxes, um, cleaning up a mess, vacuuming. All of these events are family support items, and you just pick one. And if you like it, do it. But when you start it, you finish it. And then as you grow through it, people get used to in a, in a um, basically get into a rhythm of, of things that they like to do. I like to do dishes in the morning when I wake up, when I make breakfast. That's actually a, a pleasant thing for me. Um, all right. So now lift your legs up off the ground and hold them up as long as you can. Oh, I'm in a bad position. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this and run the, the slideshow. All right. I'm going to do my best. Okay, lift them up and hold them up as long as you can. Which brings us to a wonderful slide on the tips for increasing physical activity. Make it part of your day, okay? 
don't think that you have to set aside time to go and work out someplace. Every single day you can build activity in. I work in a building that has uh, seven stories, even though it's six floors because there's a story that goes to the roof. So every single day I go to work, I walk seven flights up to walk down three because I work on the fourth floor. And I'm just, it's part of my day. It's fun for me. I get it, it, it's, I miss my stairs when I'm not at work. I'll tell you the truth. Other things you can do, push a baby in a stroller, go on, a, on an afternoon walk with the family around the neighborhood, walk up and down a soccer field or sidelines while the kids are playing, walk the dog, uh, clean the house, wash the car by hand, go out there and enjoy walk, uh, washing the car by hand. Uh, walk, skate, or cycle more, do stretches, uh, pedal a stationary bike while you're watching television, mow the lawn with a push mower, uh, plant a vegetable or flower garden, play with the kids, tumble in the leaves, build a snowman, splash in a puddle, go to the playground, play hide and seek, dance to your favorite music, exercise to a workout video. All of these things can just be part of your day. When you're going to work, park farther away. As I mentioned, I love walking up and down those stairs. Um, replace your coffee break with a 10 minute walk. I have a colleague that I walk regularly around the campus. We walk around the green quite often and um, it's just built into our days. Go as fast as you can for five or 15 minutes, even if you're going upstairs. Um, I highly recommend if you do any of these activities that increase your heart rate that you check with your physician prior to make sure that you can and then do it because I am not a physician, though I do teach physicians um, and I don't play one on TV either. So when you're playing, play and practice dance or sports with your kids, go on a nature walk, talk about the beautiful things that you see on that nature walk. As I mentioned when we first started, have an adventure. Don't have a pre-planned destination, just make that adventure where, okay, let's see where it takes us and then we'll find our way back. You could also join a fitness group class at UAB. The most important thing is to have fun while you're being active. Do it your way. Build it into your life at home, at school, at work, at play. Do it so that it is a built-in. It's not a, oh, I have to go to the gym or I have to get up early to work out. Just build it into your day. Make it part of what you're doing. The benefits of the exercise, the brain benefits are phenomenal. Increased production of neurochemicals that promote brain cell repair. Been shown to improve your memory, lengthen your attention span, boost your decision-making skills, helps the nerve cells grow and increase blood vessels improves multitasking. So the benefits are enormous. Here is a study that was done by Tim Church. He's an MD, PhD at Pennington, or he was when he did this study. On this scale is a mental health scale. This is a control group in the number of minutes that they um, exercise. This is three minutes. 72 minutes had a uh, more than double, almost triple improvement in their mental health score. 136 minutes, about the same. 192 minutes was four times. So that physical activity stimulates and promotes mental health. And so what I've done down here is to break it out over a three-day week. Adults, 18 to 64, and again, check with your physician before you do any of these things. About two hours and 30 minutes a week of moderate aerobic activity, 50% of your maximum heart rate. That's a tough thing. In order to know 50%, you would have to do a maximum heart rate test, and that's a little complicated. The best example I can give you is 50% is you're walking or doing whatever it is at a pace where you're breathing hard, but you can still have a conversation. Okay, you're still able to talk. That's about 50%. But your heart rate is elevated. You can feel that you're doing something. An hour and 15 minutes of vigorous 80 to 90% max. 80 to 90% max, you can barely talk. And you are pushing it to the max. 
This one, especially, you have to talk to your physician before you do this one. Now, for kids and adolescents, 6 to 17 is 60 minutes every day of moderate or vigorous activity. At least three of those 60-minute days need to be vigorous. Every day, folks, every day they need this kind of activity. Young kids, two to five, play actively several times a day in short bursts. They're not going to have the same longevity and stamina as the, the older kids. Um, now, we've talked about activity. Now, some of you may be thinking, Man, I'm too tired to do this. Okay, so then let's talk about sleep. Eight to nine hours of sleep every night are what are recommended. When you have too little sleep, you have lower blood flow and increased cravings. And there's been studies that showed um, the, the kids that got that extra hour of sleep did 25% better on their SAT scores. So speaking of student achievement, um, they... There was a 2009 National Youth Risk Behavior Survey looking at inactivity and unhealthy diet uh, behaviors on academic achievement. And what they found that students with higher grades do these things. They are physically active at least 60 minutes a day with no less than five days a week. They did not watch television three or more hours a day on an average school day. They did not use a computer for three or more hours a day or played video games or any of those types of things. They did not drink a can, a bottle, a glass of soda or pop, including diet soda, for at least one time per day during those seven days before that survey was done. And they did not skip meal or skip eating for 24 or more hours to lose weight. Those are how they did well, the students with the higher grades. I'm gonna to have to cook a little bit because I'm, I'm a little over my time on how much we have. This is another study that looked at fast food. The gist of this is the kids that ate, and these are fifth graders, ate more fast food, had less improvement academically when they were tested in reading science and math in eighth grade than when they were in fifth grade. And the eighth grade learning gap remained even after you factored in how much they exercised, how much television they watched, other food they ate, socioeconomic status and the neighborhood characteristics. So fast food has been associated with lower gains in reading science and math when they reached eighth grade in this study. So don't stop eating. It's just eat better nutrient dense foods and increase your daily physical activity levels. When you cut out foods, so one of the bad uh, things that diet has come to mean is reduced calories. When diet just means the food compositions that you're eating. So when you are taking, trying to lose weight, and in this cartoon, they have associated that with dieting, you actually slow down your metabolism because your body thinks you're starving. And so it actually is slowing your metabolism down and not speeding it up. And then you have what is called a rebound effect because your body has what's called an adipostat where there's a certain amount of weight that your body gets used to. When you drop that weight, your body wants to bring it back up. So you have a rebound effect where you gain more of that weight than when you initially had lost it because you have decreased caloric intake as opposed to increased nutrient dense food intake that will help you energetically and increase your activity um, and also help you to maintain that weight after you have lost it. So happy people don't have the best of everything, but they made the best of everything. And I love quotes and I'll share a couple more. This is my favorite one. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. This is Van Goethe. What I'm saying is I've just shared a bunch of information with you. So now you know these things, but now it's the time to apply these things. Anybody still got their legs up, by the way? 
Um, let me know at the end of this. And willing is not enough. Just do it. So the choices that you make at the grocery store are the choices that you'll be able to make at the house. It's a lot harder to eat that pack of whatever if the pack of whatever isn't in your house. Or you can do what I do. So we have a chest freezer in the basement. That's where the Grater's ice cream is. I've got 150 pounds of weights, all in individual weights, 25s down to 10s, that if the kids or we, me, want that ice cream, I have to remove 150 pounds of weight to get into the chest freezer. You can help yourself to be more aware of what you're doing. And just do it for life. <clears throat> That's it. I think I made time uh, three minutes to go. Um, and now we have time for questions. Fantastic information. I love putting weights on on the, the chest freezer. That is something I would never have thought. Real quickly, favorite herbivore. Mine, I would say rhino or panda. You? Favorite herbivore? I'm, I'm going prehistoric. I would go with the brontosaurus. Nice, nice. So you mentioned ranch dip, um, especially for broccoli and some other healthy stuff. Is there a type of ranch that people should gravitate towards as opposed to just grabbing the first one off the shelf? Look at the amount of added sugars and fats. I mean, and, and, and it's going to be a flavor profile that you're going to enjoy. Um, the ranch is really a vehicle to allow those kids to get used to those new foods and the bitter foods, especially. Um, if you're able to get away from that, fine. Or you could go with hummus. I mean, there are other dips that you can use that have a healthier nutrient based plant based foods in them. Love a hummus. If anybody in the audience does have questions, go ahead, drop them in the chat. We'll get to those. You know, a lot of what you've talked about seems to have interaction with the littles involved. Is that a key component to getting them to buy in, to kind of give them a choice and and having them part of the, part, the process? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's been some fruits and vegetables that the kids have picked that they were adamant. They were certain it was going to be something tasty. And we could not figure out how to cook some of these things or if we were actually doing it properly. And it was just that it looked cool. And so that is part of the fun of it is as you're going through this is they are absolutely in the process. And when they make that choice, they realize, hey, I might have picked a bad one, but y'all got to eat it, too. And so we're eating something that they pick, just like we're asking them to eat something that we picked. Now, you mentioned family support items, chores, um, as us commenters call them. I love the, the wording that you use. How do you encourage the youngsters to actually enjoy doing chores or the family support items because let's face it i've got three kids they hate doing so anything like that. multiple different ways we love to play music while we do these things and also on any given week they start with all of their privileges as long as the family support items are done they have every privilege they want anything that they want to ask for to do they have in their arsenal as long as the family support items are done. When the family support items aren't done and they ask for something, I just say, well, hey, how about that family support item? Remember, your privileges come with that and you didn't do that, so that privilege isn't there right now. If you do it, yes. And so we build it into, they realize that without that family support, the privileges they're not gonna be able to go to because then you're gonna come back and the house is gonna be trashed. And I just got a hashtag rude from my audience here at home because I called them out for doing their family support items or lack of. So <laughs> do you recommend it? I'm probably going to get another one here. <laughs> Mine are in the other room. <laughs> do you That's recommend great. vitamin B or, uh, pills or injections? Uh, so, okay, I'm not a registered dietitian, mm -hmm. although I do teach them. Uh, B complex and B12, I take every day. And they are your energy cofactors. Without them, you cannot use the foods that you're eating. So the short answer is yes. Um, B12, especially for vegetarians or vegans, you are not getting any of that. And the B complex, yes. So I, I take them every day, even though I'm eating the balanced meals that I'm eating. The data for vitamin supplementation has null effect 
which means they show no benefit and no harm. So for those that are deficient, here's the thing that most don't realize. RDAs and RDVs on the, on the labels that say this is a recommended daily value or recommended daily allowance of vitamins and other things that you need, that is the minimum where 2 to 3% of the population still has a deficiency. That's not the optimal level that's going to give you optimal um, metabolism and optimal energy. That is the bare minimum where you're not getting a disease. So most of us are deficient and don't even know it. Do you, can you speak on the dangers of pesticides on fruits or other foods? Yes, wash them. Absolutely. Definitely wash them. And that's something we struggle with a lot. So I've gone through a bunch of different ways. Um, I've gone to a vinegar water spray and then I got the spinner that actually spins it dry. It still tastes funky. Um, absolutely. As best you can without losing the flavor or damaging it. Yes, yes, yes. How many eggs are safe for adults to eat weekly? That's a personal dependent question. It depends on that person. It depends on their gender, their age, their weight, their activity level. So I cannot answer that as an aggregate question. If you have healthy activity, healthy uh, choices uh, in terms of calorie intake, eggs are a wonderful nutrient-dense food. Think about it this way. A chicken has everything it needs to live. So from a balanced nutrient basis, eggs are, are really good. The yolks have the biotin, which give you healthy uh, nails, skin, hair. Um, the protein's going to be in the white component. As far as I cannot give an answer because I don't know that person and I'm not an RDN. I can tell you what I eat. <laughs> I eat three to four a day but I can't recommend what somebody else should do. That's outside of my credentialing. And that's fair enough. Uh, is basmati rice better for you than brown rice? Which is best nutritionally? Uh, brown rice is gonna be more of a whole grain rice. And uh, the basmati is, is not quite as nutrient dense, uh, but I love the basmati. And I love jasmine too. Um, mix it around. Um, add, uh, what I would recommend is vary it. What is the family support item your family absolutely hates to do? Cat, cat boxes. Cat boxes. And I, I saw the two over your shoulder. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> They've been very uh, active. Well, during COVID, uh, everything shut down and we had, our daughter just got, uh, uh a male and a female cat. Two weeks before they were supposed to be spayed and neutered, the vet clinic closed down because of COVID. And we had some births. <laughs> they were all gifted to friends of our kids, but the friends didn't ask their parents. And when we went to say, hey, we heard you're taking these cats, they were like, we're doing what? And so the gifted cats, only one out of the the four, the five born were gifted and the other ones got names. And now we have a, a cat family. <laughs> so Dr. cat boxes is the least, least fun. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Dr. Mollering, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I really hope uh, folks have taken to like some of the things I said and, and reach out to me. I think my email is going to be shared. Um, I welcome talking about this and, and given more of my time, if, uh, if there are further questions or point people in the right direction to those that are credentialed to ask specific questions, uh, have them answered. Fantastic. And we will be including that email address on the follow-up. A quick reminder, a recording of this webinar will be made available on our website starting tomorrow. Tonight's attendees will get an email with the replay link once it has been uploaded. In a moment, I'll highlight a few upcoming webinars, but first, come on, join us for the 17th Annual Scholarship Run. Talk about staying healthy, presented by Viva Health. On April 15th, we'll be at the Battery in Homewood for this annual event and would love for you to help us as we support students' scholarships. Can't make it for the in-person 5K or 10K? No worries. 
register to participate in our virtual run. You can find out more at alumni.uab.edu slash 5K10K. As promised, here's a look at some of the upcoming webinars we have scheduled on Thursday, April 13th. Take part in Burnout in Youth Sports, Why Early Specialization is Not So Special. In this first of a five-part series for parents of young athletes, Dr. Chris Spellman will delve into what you need to know to help your child from burning out. On Thursday, May 4th, come back for Mischief Managed, the way in which Harry Potter transfixed a generation. Ebony Harris and Jen Ivey will explore the Potterverse and explain what's behind Harry and his friend's popularity. On Tuesday, May 23rd, we'll host part two of our five-part youth athlete series, Brainstorming, a deeper look into sports-related concussions. Dr. Sarah Gold, Dr. Heath Hale, and Dr. Kathy Weiss will take a look at what's behind the rising concerns around concussions. And on Tuesday, June 6th, get ready for your next pool party with Summer Mixology. Join craft distiller Brian Rabin for this interactive mixology class where we'll make five delectable concoctions together. Register or find out more about these or others at alumni.uab.edu slash events. Finally, let us know how we're doing. The QR code on the screen will take you to a quick survey. Share your thoughts on tonight's webinar and what you'd like to see in the future. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar. And as always, go Blazers.